So my name is Hans de Goede. I work for Red Hat on uh, desktop hardware enablement. And today I would like to talk to you about Flickr Free Boot. And um, I actually plan to keep it short because I always like to have a bit of discussion at the end, questions slash discussion. So I'll go through the slides a bit quickly. So this is the, the basic things I would like to discuss. Basically the, the boot order, right? We start before the kernel, then we have the kernel, and then we get user space, and hopefully eventually we get to the login screen. So a Flickr free boot. Uh, this has been something which has been discussed along Linux desktop people. I know Ubuntu has worked on it in the past, or Canonical, uh, for a decade, I guess, or more. Uh, the purpose is both simple and complex. It is to uh, basically boot the machine without any visual jarring transitions, right? So especially in the past when uh, uh, lots of people still had external VGA monitors, if you do a mode set, right, so if you reprogram the graphics hardware, to often essentially get back the same resolution as the firmware just initialized it to, uh, the screen loses sync and then it takes one or two seconds to get a picture back. That's where the original Flickr free term comes from. Uh, since it took us a decade to get there, we, we, uh, I've gone slightly further. I not only want to uh, not do a mode set ever, so never have the screen lose sync, I also want to have everything visual pleasant, so not, uh, I mean, you can keep sync and, and throw a black screen on there. Right, so you get the vendor logo usually when you turn on the machine and then a black screen or a grub menu. We are already there at some level that some of these transitions don't cause a sync. Right? They don't cause a mode set, they don't cause the, the monitor to lose its vSync signal. Uh, but they are still ugly, so we also want to get rid of those. So it's not only about not losing signal to the monitor, it's also about uh, having all the graphical transitions be nice and non-jarring. Interesting thing which I've noticed on the internet is technical users often don't care much about this. And they sometimes even complain that I'm hiding all the useful informational messages. Like, where did all my beautiful scrolling text go? Uh, I swept it under the rug. At least according to Pharonix. Some Pharonix user posted a picture of someone sweeping stuff under the rug. So, uh, sure. I'm sweeping all the technical messages under the rug. But for regular users and also for OEMs, which we, which we, whom we have some contact. And also for uh, embedded hardware, often if you look at your, your phone, your phone essentially already does something which resembles Flickr Free Boot, right? It tries to show a splash and keep that going and moving while it's booting. So uh, this is something which definitely for, for vendors is important and I also think for regular users. Uh, I know for a fact when I talk to Red Hat's internal IT, right? They, they uh, administer all our laptops, also the laptops for the salespeople. The salespeople get a laptop with uh, a, a flavor of Red Hat Enterprise Linux on there. And our uh, internal IT people were really happy that I was getting rid of the grub menu, because default by Fedora you've got a menu like, do you want to boot the latest kernel or one version older or another version older? And that just confuses the hell out of regular users. So, <laughs> so we're working on, on cleaning that all up. So that's a bit about what and why. Now let's go through all the phases of the boot process. So uh, when I started working on this, my goal was mainly to keep the vendor logo on the screen. Uh, my first version just kept the vendor logo on the screen all the way into GDM. And that means that something like Shim, have you ever seen, you, do you all know what Shim is? Shim is a little thingy which loads before uh, Grub and basically it hands over, uh, it's, it's, it's a, transition between two signing keys, two, two key chains. Shim is signed by Microsoft for us, so it allows us to have Linux working, Fedora working, or Ubuntu working on a machine which has secure boot enabled. And itself, it has a different uh, public certificate of our own key chain, and it checks that Grub and then the kernel, etc., is signed with Fedora or Ubuntu's key. So Shim normally is completely quiet. It will only show you a text message if something is seriously wrong. But still, the first line in its main function was uh, ask the UAFI uh, a frame buffer to go into text mode, which makes it turn black. So uh, pretty much same story for Grub. So what I did for both, I, uh, I patched them to make the call to put the frame buffer in text mode, so turn it into a text console on demand. So they only do this, now they do this when they print the first character of a message. Uh, that pretty much solves uh, Shim and Grub. Uh, for all the, the changes I've done, I also have a line on my slides which uh, 
Uh, this causes the upstream state. Unfortunately, uh, the shim changes are upstream. That's fine. Unfortunately for Grub, I've been unable to get this upstream. I haven't even submitted the patches to delay uh, the switch to text mode call to the first character printed upstream, because before I can do that, I need to get another patch head upstream, which uh, I like to call the, the, the shut the fuck up patch head, because Grub by itself is pretty verbose. It prints uh, a version header, for example. <laughs> Which is really useful because Grub hasn't seen a release in like forever. <laughs> so all the distros have a heavily patched Grub and the version header of all the distros says 2.02. So you still have no clue which Grub flavor you're actually running. But they insist that that version header is there and I've been unable to convince them in a, with a reasonable patch set. They had some weird idea which was like two weeks of work to make it runtime configurable, the printing of the version header and I said no. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, the crop changes, long story short, are not upstream. Uh, so the next step is the kernel booting. And the kernel actually, uh, on a normal boot, on a UEFI system, and this is all about EFI systems, classic BIOS boot is sort of dead, uh, actually has two graphical drivers. First, during early boot, the EFI frame buffer driver loads. That just reuses the frame buffer which it gets from the EFI firmware. It doesn't touch the graphics hardware at all. It just takes that frame buffer and it gives other applications or internal users the options to draw on the screen. Uh, what used to happen is that the, there is an internal user of the frame buffer driver which is called FBCOM, frame buffer console, which gives you your text console. That used to immediately say, oh, a frame buffer has become available. I'm going to claim this. I'm going to make it black and draw a blinking cursor. Given that I wanted to have no jarring graphical transitions, that don't not, did not make me happy. So same trick as with uh, Shim and Grub, I added a patch to the FBCon driver to not take over the frame buffer until the first character needs to be printed. Pretty much same story basically. Um, also, uh, another issue is before I said most machines start by drawing the vendor logo in firmware. Some machines have the vendor logo in firmware. There's an ACPI extension for that called the BGRT table, background table. Uh, but they don't draw it themselves for dollar string reasons. They rely on the Windows bootloader to draw it as soon as the bootloader loads. Usually these, these boot pretty quickly because if you have a long boot then they would have probably gone through the trouble of drawing the logo themselves. So we need to draw the logo as early as possible. Uh, so I've chosen to do that in the kernel in the EFI frame buffer code so that is capable of, of using the ACPI BGRT extension using code which was already there and it draws the logo. It does this unconditionally. It draws it over the logo which is already there. So unless I get the positioning wrong, uh, you don't, won't see any transition because it's just replacing the same pixels by the same pixels. So no tearing or whatever. Um, this is also useful in case you did get a drop menu because you have multi-boot or you press the key during boot because now it will restore the logo over the drop menu again. Uh, all patches for this are upstream. Uh, if you want to disable this for technical users who don't like things, you can use fbcon is no defer on the kernel command line to immediately get the blinking cursor again. <laughs> or a video is tfi fb colon no bgrt to disable the drawing of the logo if you like to look at whatever was there before. Uh, so the kernel, the next step is that your initial RAM disk usually loads on an Intel GPU system, and I'm currently only supporting this on Intel GPUs, sorry. Uh, <coughs> we'll load the i915 driver. Uh, the i915 driver, uh, the, I'm only interested in this case not about the 3D engine part of uh, the integrated Intel GPU, so really not the GPU part, but the display pipeline driver, the kernel mode setting part, uh, that actually has support to read back the hardware state. So what it does for a long, long time is it reads, uh, basically it's the first mode set you do. So when Plymouth loads, Plymouth will tell uh, the i915 driver set the display to this resolution, which usually is the same resolution as the firmware already <coughs> brought it up in. Microsoft actually recommends that the, the firmware brings the panel up in its native resolution and we try to put it in its native resolution. So it should be the same mode. What the i915 driver does, it creates a software copy of the register state, uh, and one or two copies actually, which it fills in with how it's going to program then, and then for one copy it reads back from the hardware and it fills in all the values which it's read back from the hardware and it compares them. And if 
the two are identical, it can optionally skip the mode set. So it says, oh, it's already programmed with exact the register values which I was planning to program in it, so why bother to go to the whole shebang? Because the whole shebang is first turn everything off and then pro turn everything on again. Uh, so uh, this is called fastboot support in the i915 driver. And this has been available for quite a long time. It's even useful on some systems because uh, a mode setting is a bit broken there and the panel doesn't come up properly if you don't use fastboot. If you use fastboot since the mode set gets skipped, it stays working. Uh, but so far this has been disabled because certain types of hardware were not working. I've been working together with uh, Martin Langhorst from Intel to fix the last few known bugs. And very recently we thrown the switch, at least for Skylake and newer. So starting in with Linux Next at the moment in the 5.1 kernel when it's released, uh, we will have uh, this enabled by default on Skylake and newer, as well as on Cherry Trail and Vetro hardware, which pretty much removes the last mode set from the boot. So with this we are flicker free. Um, it's enabled currently in Rawhide. Uh, so if you're uh, running Fedora Rawhide and uh, your display starts acting up after you apply updates tomorrow or whatever, because this, this was pushed out yesterday to Rawhide, then um, uh, yeah, let me know. I'm, uh, I'm not to blame. <laughs> uh, so user space. This one was actually interesting. Uh, Plymouth is like the graphical boot splash thingy which uh, shows some animation and shows not entirely unimportant your disk unlock screen if you have a encrypted disk. Uh, there was quite a bit of work to do here. Um, until recently, uh, Plymouth actually secretly relied on FBCon to do a bunch of stuff. So what's happening is that FBCon, the frame buffer console driver, uh, when it was taking over the frame buffer, it would go over all the connected monitors and give them all a mode. Well, the FBDEV emulation layer in the kernel was doing that, but because FBCon was using it. Uh, and Plymouth was relying on all the connectors already having a CRTC assigned, so that's the scan-out engine basically, and having a mode set. And it just took over whatever it found. But since we were now deferring FBCon takeover, so we were not triggering the FBDEV emulation layer in its path, uh, only the LCD screen on a lot of laptops was working. External monitors weren't because they didn't have a CRTC assigned, they didn't have a mode set. And if Beacon wasn't doing this anymore, so I have to, I've pretty much rewritten the Plymouth uh, DRM plugin, the kernel mode setting plugin for Plymouth, to uh, pick modes, pick CRTCs, and the second round of rewriting was also at hot plug support. Because before this, Plymouth, uh, that was actually an existing problem where FBCon didn't help. Uh, before I started working on this, Plymouth used to scan all outputs once and then just take what it would find. Uh, the problem is nowadays most docs for laptops, they use something called DisplayPort MST, DisplayPort Multi-Stream Transport, which means that you get a single DisplayPort link to your docking station and then it gets split up like sort of a hub or switch in network does into multiple display outputs and enumerating that takes a while. So what was happening was that uh, uh, the initrd loaded the i915 driver and then immediately started Plymouth. And Plymouth scanned the connectors while the monitors connected to the dock were still being enumerated, so it didn't see them. Because when it was scanning them, they were not seen as in being in connected state yet. That's fixed by adding, uh, by adding hot, hot, hot plug support, also useful if you may have noticed once if you use this script that if you boot your laptop and you have your disk script screen already standing there and you plugged in an external monitor, the external monitor wouldn't show the disk script screen. That's also fixed by the hot plug support. So uh, uh, the last stop in Plymouth is uh, uh, actually adding support for it to read the, the firmware background from the ACPI extension so that it can use that as a background. So when Plymouth now uh, starts drawing an animation, well, you saw it already in the videos, right? You keep the logo and you're, there was a Fedora logo beneath it, and so it looks like it's drawing over the firmware background. It is in essence, but it's not reading the firmware background out of the frame buffer. It's not reading the frame buffer, because that, what? Why not? Why not? Oh, well, because uh, external monitors are not light up, so they don't have a frame buffer yet, and I still want to put something there. Uh, there could be total garbage there. I don't know what's there. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it was better this way, even though it was uh, some work to get this right. Because I had a lot of work to figure out exactly where to put the logo, because the logo actually is not screen filling. So I need to put it in the exact same place as uh, 
where the firmware puts it. And it was a bit tricky, but I figured it out. And I won't go into details because that's, uh, uh, we don't have time for that. Um, all patches for this are upstream. So uh, the last item I would like to discuss, user space related, is user space frame buffer handover. Uh, this is a thing when, when Plymouth first installs its, its frame buffer, then when GDM starts, if Plymouth were to exit, uh, what happens is uh, the i950 driver, if the process which owns the frame buffer exits, it needs something to send, right? Video is constantly be, being, being scanned out, right? Continue all the pixels from the top of the screen are being drawn. It needs to still send something to the video outputs. So it has something which I call the fallback frame buffer. I don't know how it's called internally by the Intel guys. And that's usually the frame buffer which they inherit from the video BIOS or from the graphics operations region of EFI. Uh, so what would happen is when Plymouth exited, you would fall back to the logo, which isn't actually that bad because we were already drawing on top of the logo. Uh, but it does look bad if you have a different Plymouth team, which doesn't draw on top of the logo. So Plymouth already had support for doing a handover where you wouldn't go to the fallback frame buffer. Which happens is first Plymouth is told to stop, uh, I think by system D. But when it's told to stop, it doesn't exit. It doesn't also free the frame buffer, but it drops its DRM master rights, so someone else can start controlling the mode setting. Then a GDM gets started by uh, system D. GDM sets up its own frame buffer and tells the i915 driver to start scanning out its frame buffer, which it can do now because uh, uh, Plymouth dropped the master rights. And after that it tells Plymouth it's okay to quit, and then Plymouth exits. And this works nicely between Plymouth and GDM because Plymouth has a special IPC mechanism where you can tell it things like stop, exit. And it do this doesn't work so well for starting the user session. We have the same issue where we nowadays, because uh, uh, with Wayland we want to run the compositor as the user, and also nowadays we support running xorg as the user instead of as root, so we can no longer use the same display server for the login manager and for the user session. So we start a new display manager, which needs to take over the frame buffer. We do the same trick, but without the user session helping us. We drop the URM master rights, we start the user session, and then we sleep 10 seconds, and we hope that within those 10 seconds, the user session has installed its own frame buffer. Now, why is this interesting? This is interesting because uh, I would like to make some kernel changes, and I hope there are some kernel devs here in the room, I think there are, uh, to make this suck less. So actually about a year ago, a colleague of mine, Rob Clark, completely independent of me and of this effort, uh, posted an IOCTL, a new uh, kernel mode setting IOCTL, which he thought would be useful, which basically is, uh, I'm handing over this frame buffer to you, but please don't destroy it. Just keep scanning out of it, even if I exit, until someone else installs a different frame buffer. Right? So currently the rule is that frame buffer lifetime is bound to the process which owns the frame buffer, but there's no reason for it. The frame buffer is an in-kernel object. It could keep it alive longer than the process. It could keep a ref reference count on it and just drop it when it no longer needs it because a new frame buffer is installed. So new IOCTL for this, a very good idea. It would make the whole dance with Plymouth unnecessary. It would make the whole dance between GDM and the user session unnecessary. Uh, it would also fix some ugliness which we still have on shutdown, because on shutdown we get similar problems, because then we go from user session to Plymouth. Um, a problem is that this has some privacy concerns. If you go from a user session and you log out or you shut down, uh, there could be private sensitive stuff on the screen. And the next process which comes after you could theoretically, if the frame buffer sticks around, uh, scrape the frame buffer. Or, some, or if the machine hangs during shutdown, and Plymouth never starts and never takes over, a user could come walking up and see whatever was lost on your screen. So, uh, yeah, that's a problem. My proposal here is that uh, this means that we shouldn't blindly always use the IOCTL. In uh, Mother running on top of Wayland, so GNOME 3 on top of Wayland, uh, or GNOME 3 in this case is the Wayland compositor, so whatever, it's not on top of. Uh, we could fix this by simply closing all the windows, doing a draw, so that we're just drawing the desktop background and the panel, and then make the IOCTL to uh, keep the frame buffer around until someone else takes over. That means that your worst case scenario, your background will leak. Uh, if you have a not suitable for, for work background or whatever, yeah, tough luck. Uh, on the other hand, this also means that if you're still running a desktop environment on top of XORG, XORG 
cannot know when it will be a clean exit, basically. So probably not Well, we could make X org just blank the screen to make it turn black or something, but then it will again be visual jarring, so we're not really winning anything. So this IOPTL is probably not useful for X, only for Wayland compositors, which can do something smart, just draw the background before. So as promised, I kept it short-ish, actually longer than I planned, but I had five minutes extra, so that's fine. So, time for discussion or questions. Go ahead. So, couldn't you add an X extension that allows the desktop environment to tell the X server that all privacy sensitive stuff has been released from the screen? That's definitely an option, but I don't see anyone going doing the work for that. But if someone volunteers, sure. What about entering suspense? I, I have all my laptops flickering like crazy, and so I think that's uh, that's a good one. Actually, uh, well, Fastboot should help if you have an i915 driver, actually, because uh, the hardware readback thingy is not only done on boot, it's also done after a resume. So on, at least on resume it should help with flickers. I don't know if you see any flickers on suspend. That sounds like your video BIOS or firmware just is being nasty and it's turning the black... The which desktop environment are you using? Right now, no, but happens also on Xbox. Okay. And Wayland. Weird? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I don't really have an answer. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another kind of detail, but um, for the frame buffer handover, why, why an IOPTL? I mean, if you use atomic mode setting, can you just make a copy? Oh, sure. So first, let me repeat the question, which I forgot for the last two, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Oh, the mics are good enough. Great. Uh, anyway, the question was, why an IOCTL for telling the frame buffer to stick around, why not a property? Um, if I remember correctly, Rob Clark decided for an IOCTL, but a property could work, I guess. But it doesn't feel, I mean, RM, FB, like I'm done with this frame buffer, I'm unreferencing it. But currently it means unref and delete in one go, basically. Uh, is also an IOCTL, and adding an FB to a CRTC is also, so it sort of feels like it belongs in that row of operations. And as a property, it feels weird, because you could set the stick around property, and then decide to unset it again, or make it false, and then what? So that's also, it's sort of a one-time thing, right? In a property, you can change again later, so. Um, I have a question. Uh, do you also test your flicker-free boot in a, in a virtual environment, if you boot a system in a virtual box? Because in my experience, also things like Plymouth are not as stable in a virtual environment as they are mm -hmm. in a, on a real uh, mm -hmm. metal system. So that's a good question. Uh, I do intend to test this in virtual box, because virtual box has uh, support for booting in UEFI mode. Again, this is only for UEFI, because BIOS boot is just broken in so many ways that I haven't bothered. Uh, when it comes to Flickr free, um, I've actually been talking to uh, to uh, the virtual box guys about making uh, UEFI boot the default when you create a new uh, Fedora or well VM. Uh, you may know I've also been working on mainlining a bunch of the virtual box guest drivers, putting them in the mainline kernel. So I know the virtual box guys well. Uh, yeah, I, I do need to test this, but actually there there shouldn't be any difference. But <laughs> I guess. Okay, last row. I don't appear to be that happy about Grub. Why not use System Reboot? That's a very good question, and the answer is mostly a uniformity between all the different platforms we support. We run, use Grub almost everywhere, and System Reboot only works in UEFI and not in Classic. We I don't support classic BIOS boot with this, but we do still support classic BIOS boot if you accept that it will flicker a couple of times in Fedora, and we will probably do so for a long, long time, because again, a lot of technical users who like to see all the scrolling messages also for some reason like to use classic BIOS boot, probably because uh, inertia, right? A while ago, UEFI support was pretty bad in Linux, or not that good, so everyone flipped the BIOS default to use classic boot, and a lot of Technical users are still doing that. I think if you look at our 
Well, I think it actually it was what was canonical who published statistics about this. Uh, uh, because they recently they published a bunch of the statistics they got there, and I think 50% of all the machines were, were BIOS boot. That's probably skewed because it probably contains VMs, and for some reason VMs all still use classic BIOS boot, even though there is no really good reason for this. Maybe but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's broken in different ways. <laughs> Trust me, I've done enough with firmware at all levels of firmware pretty much. I've touched a whole a lot of the, the stack in general. Um, firmware is just broken somewhere, some of the time, well, most of the time maybe even, and we just get to work around it. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, yes, UEFI is contains more functionality and as such may be more complex, but actually from the bootloader point of view and from the uh, operating system point of view, UEFI is easier to deal with, that's the whole reason why it is invented, than classic BIOS boot. I so think also in many cases that's one of the first switches people flick when they have any installation problem. And even yeah. if it ends up being something else, they just never flick it back. Yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of uh, uh, more experienced Linux users, uh, they flick it on a new machine even before installing, just because they've been doing that for the last five installs or five generations of hardware or whatever. But yeah, um, classic BIOS boot is something which we need to support, so that's the reason why we stick with Grub. I think we also use Grub on ARM now, on top of... Uh, Actually, on ARM, what we're doing now is we're loading U-Boot, and then U-Boot on top gets the open source UEFI implementation, and then we load Grub so that it looks a lot like x86 because we want to unify our early boot as much as possible because of support load and stuff. So yeah, we're we're working on making ARM look like x86. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, what if other login manager is used, not uh, JDM? If an other display manager is used, you mean login manager, then uh, you shouldn't do that. I'm sorry, the, the only other display manager which is still seeing some level of uh, upstream maintenance is LightDM. Uh, I worked back before Wayland was even a thing, so like five years ago, on making the X server run as a regular user instead of root, because the X server is known as a huge attack surface, so running that as root is not a good idea. This needs cooperation from the display manager. I filed a bug against LightDM five years ago. Please spawn the X session as regular user. This is what you need to do to make this happen. You need to set up the TTI beforehand because it cannot do that if it doesn't have root, yada yada. They still haven't fixed that. I'm sorry, if they haven't implemented such an important security feature as not running root, uh, not running X as a regular uh, as root, they are still running it as root if you use like DM. The only advice I can give you is just use GDM. Even if you're using it to start KDE, <laughs> you will still get your KDE running as regular user with an X as regular user instead of as root. And it supports things like fingerprint reader infinitely better and... But it doesn't support language selection. And it doesn't support storing the session across different computers. GDM 2.2 for that, and it's kind of annoying when you're uh, deploying in a, in a huge department. That could be. So, uh, what? FDM. But I, I just checked the last commit was on the 31st of December. Yeah. Of? Of last year, so it's basically like a month old, the last commit. I uh, like DM, you mean? No, SDDM. SDDM, oh, it's still seeing some commits, okay. And when, when was the, l the last release? <laughs> well, we're out of time for questions. <laughs> 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 we really are almost yeah, out of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I... Let's keep going. Okay, so last question. No, 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 it's, it's, it's over time. Oh, it's over time. Okay, sorry. We can continue in all ways. <laughs> <laughs>